Man, if you're in love with Jesus, say, I am. I am. Woo -hoo -hoo. Hey, it's really great to be in the house of the Lord and worshiping with each and every one of you this morning. Just want to remind you that uh, the February Rise Prayer Challenge, it's not too late to jump in. Uh, it's every morning at 6 a.m. And uh, we, you can go and get registered through our website and you'll be sending the link and uh, you can join us there. Uh, super exciting week because it is uh, our week of Night to Shine, which is happening on Friday. Listen to this, listen to this. We have 63 honored guests that we will be loving on this coming Friday. Praise God. Woo! And we have 100 volunteers registered. We actually had to cut off registration here towards the end of the week, so we're super excited uh, to be able to uh, be used by God in such a, a special uh, honoring way. We are taking up a special offering this morning for Night to Shine. It's about a $10,000 project. We have about $6,500 that have come in uh, so far. If you would like to uh, give or contribute towards that, you can give with that same QR code that's on the seat back in front of you or on the screen behind me, or you you can take an offering envelope. Uh, maybe you want to drop a little bit in that envelope. You can just write night to shine uh, on that envelope and stick it in the black box uh, by the elevator. Thank you. And please keep us in prayer as we got a lot of people doing a lot of things. And then Friday night, all chaos begins in a lot with a lot of fun. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. Amen. Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've been doing in our hearts. Your word is so awesome. And God, this morning, I pray that once again, your word would speak loudly, clearly. And Lord God, that you would draw us closer to you. If there be anyone here, Lord God, who's not walking with you, living for you, God, having yet to give their lives to you, God, we pray this morning that, God, you would overwhelmingly, Lord God, make your love real to them. And God, that they would come to that place of surrender today. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 14, 25 through 33, we've been starting off each of the, the last several weeks with the same portion of scripture. If you would turn there with me this morning or follow along on the, on the screens behind me, let's read. Now, a great, now great crowds accompanied him, Jesus, and he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not first sit down and, de and first deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. We're in this series called The Disciple. Uh, also this morning, we're gonna launch our new theme for 2023. Uh, we're prayerfully really excited about our new theme. This is such an important series because it does not just give us a little glimpse into the early disciples, but what this series is doing is giving us a biblical sketch of our new identity in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is passed away. Behold, the new has come. In Christ, we've been given a new identity. We're no longer sinners on a course for the judgment of God, but we have been made new. Someone say, praise God. And we've been given a new identity, one that we share with many, many others who have come to the foot of the cross and laid their life down and said, Jesus, we will follow you, and we have put our faith in what Christ did for us there on that cross, and through his resurrection, we receive the gift of God, the free gift of God, which is salvation, that though it cost us nothing for, to have our sins forgiven, it will cost us everything to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Our shared identity of being a disciple uh, never, never came to a place where Jesus asked us to invite us or to invite him into our hearts. He never did that. He didn't say, invite me into your heart. What he said was, come and follow me. 
In chapter five of the book of Matthew, Jesus gives one of his most famous sermons in uh, his time of ministry. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, he lays out for us the Beatitudes. Of all these Beatitudes, what they are are identifiers of the follower of Jesus Christ or the disciple or the Christian, however you wanna be uh, called. In this famous sermon, Jesus begins establishing a code by which those who follow him should live, must live. And we, uh, I am calling it the disciple code. That's my way of, of summing up the Beatitudes. Now, the disciple code is not a requirement for salvation, but it is a result of our salvation. I have a question for you this morning. What types of things do you crave in life? Think about that. Success, popularity, good health, wealth, power, ice cream. Someone say amen. Amen. Have you ever noticed uh, that when you crave sweets, and I'm a big sweet person, it's one of my faults, Uh, have you ever noticed how difficult it is just to have one cookie (laughs) or or one spoonful of of ice cream? Most of the things that we crave or, uh, or, or that we long for after we consume them, they only leave us wanting more. There's a story of a pastor who was visiting a couple from his church, he was at their home, and atop the mantle of their fireplace was this painting of a very beautiful, uh, roomy, large home, and the pastor inquired about the painting. Why is it above your mantle? And the couple replied, oh, that's our dream home. After a few years, the couple actually had built that home for themselves. They invited the pastor back over to their new home, and as the pastor went to visit them, he noticed uh, up above their new mantle, their new fireplace, Uh, uh, an even more beautiful and an even larger and roomier home there. And again, the pastor inquired, and they, what is that? And they said, oh, that's our dream home, they explained. The question for us this morning is this, will our appetites ever be satisfied by the things of this world, or will we always be creatures who just crave more? Say crave. Crave. Say it one more time, crave. Crave. Now, this is the theme for 2023. It's crave. It's been woven in every message since the beginning of the year. And uh, it's, it's, it's a powerful term that I want us to contemplate on today. What are we craving in life? What are those things that we're trying to fill that inner need deep down within our souls? Restlessness and longing, they're universal traits of the human heart. Every human being Russells with this longing to, to, to be significant or to, to, to have that place that fills empty on the inside of them, filled with something of sustenance, something that will last, something that won't just go away, like having a scoop of ice cream and then wanting more, and taking another scoop and then wanting more, but wanting to be able to partake of something that fills that inner need, and we can rest there, say rest. We want to rest in the power and the presence of something. And I believe God is the only one who can fill that place in our heart. George Herbert wrote a poem back in 1633. It's called The Pulley. If you're into poetry, perhaps you've read it. The Pulley is a reflection on humanity's restlessness and God's loving wisdom. In this tender, witty poem, the, the speaker imagines God creating humankind and giving people every possible blessing but one, rest. The poem suggests a longing for a a kind of peace that one cannot find by the things that we have in our visual access or audible access in the world around us. It suggests that this longing for peace is just another part of God's plan to draw humanity back into his own divine embrace. Let's read the pulley this morning. When God at first made man... Having a glass of blessing standing by, let us, he said, pour on him all we can. Let the world's riches be dispersed, lie, contract into a span. So strength first made a way, then beauty followed, then wisdom, honor, pleasure. When almost all was out, God made a stay, perceiving that alone all of his treasure rest in the bottom lay. For if I should, he said, bestow this jewel also on my creature. He would adore my gifts instead of me and rest in nature, not the God of nature, so both would losers be. 
Yet let him keep the rest, but keep them with repining restlessness. Let him be rich and weary, that at least if goodness lead him not, yet weariness may toss him into my breast. God has put a hunger and a thirst into the hearts of men that cannot be filled by the things of this world. How many of you know what I'm talking about this morning? There should be a resounding amen right there because you and I, we all know what it's like to search for meaning in life, to search for something to fill that inner void that all of us possess from the time we're born to the time that hopefully we've met the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning and you've not met the Lord Jesus Christ, then you still feel and ex experience that restlessness, that lack of peace on a daily basis. There are even those who have come to the cross who have not yet learned that Jesus is their fill, that, 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 that come to the cross as a matter of religion more so than a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. For when you come to Christ out of religion, you're no different than anyone else in the world who's not yet found peace through a relationship with God by the gift of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There are so many things in this world that many of us, we, if we, we could all write lists and we would, we would almost form a little book of all the things that we've tried to meet that innermost need of our heart only to like the scoop of ice cream or only like a piece of chocolate to wake up and just, just wanting more and more, it's never enough. There's this longing deep down in every person that cannot, will not ever be satisfied by the things that this world has to offer. People will spend enormous amounts of time and money trying to satisfy this craving that they feel down inside of them. They try to satisfy it with big, lavish, expensive vacations, accomplishments of creativity, stunning cinematic productions, sexual exploits, sports, work, drugs, alcohol, philosophies, and even religion itself. But that longing remains. And the more and more we try this and we try that and we grab for that and we grab for this, the more that longing on the inside of us intensifies, only leaving us feeling even more void than we did before we tried the world's offering. In reality, you will never be satisfied by anything that this world has to offer you. How many of you uh, remember the Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger? You guys, you guys, all of us, come on, we grew up, we know that. He wrote a song, they sang a song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. Come on, sing it. I can't get no satisfaction. Cause I try, and I try, and I try, and I try. I can't get no, I can't get no. There are several, there are several in this room this morning who's like the song. You try and you try and you try, but every ending of every day you're left at the same place, you're not satisfied. You have no satisfaction. Your soul is hungry. Your heart is thirsty. You feel this insatiable craving for something. You're restless and almost everywhere you turn, though you try, you can't get no satisfaction. When your hunger and thirst kicks in, it's just like you seem to stop and you'll go to great lengths to try to quench that thirst and feed that hunger on your own, but you never get anywhere. It's, it's like sometimes I get a craving, say craving, crave. say crave. crave, it's our theme for 2023. There's both the negative side of crave, which we seem to be focusing on in the moment, but there's also a positive side of crave that we're going to get to in a moment, but, but there are times where I crave chocolate, and I go to the primary cupboard, and I open it, and there's nothing there but crackers. I want chocolate. <laughs> and I begin looking all over the house. I'm like, there's got to be a piece of chocolate around here somewhere. I even go down in the basement. Maybe there's a gift we forgot to give someone at Christmas time, and there's a piece of chocolate left in the gift. You know what I'm talking about. When sport teams win, cha win a championship, the athletes will often talk about having been hungry for the championship. In just one week, we've got the Super Bowl. We got the Kansas City Chiefs against, the, I can't even say their name, the, the Philadelphia Eagles.
And they're all working hard. They've been working hard all season. Every team works hard all season. They get paid a lot of money, I know, but still they work hard. They get to practice. They're working all day long on their skill. They're working all day long. They're running. They're doing their workouts. They're working on everything of precision to try to get to where the Eagles and the Chiefs are next week, that place called the Super Bowl. And they're going to play a phenomenal game. Hopefully it's a phenomenal game that we'll still enjoy, even if we're not an Eagles fan or a Chiefs fan. But it'll be a lot of fun because there will be a lot of food, right? <laughs> they're going to be working really hard for that Super Bowl trophy. But here's the thing. They get that trophy, and guess what? The next day, it starts all over again. The very next day, they're on to next year. They have, they have one or two times of celebrating the big trophy, but after it, it leaves them wanting more. They are looking ahead to next year. That trophy did not satisfy them on the inside. They want more, they want more, they want another trophy. And that's the way life is. Anything that does not have to do with the God that created us, it always leaves us wanting more. It tricks us. It deceives us. It tells us that it will meet that need. And you know what? For a very brief moment, it will meet the need. And then as soon as you give in to that craving, the appetite just grows bigger on the inside of you. And you're left in a more def, de, uh, destitute state than you were prior to partaking. To crave means to earnestly seek after, to want greatly, to yearn for, to pursue with a passion, not relenting. With the word crave in mind, we're going to make the switch from the negative to the positive here. Listen to the words of Jesus Christ as he continues to teach the crowds. He's on this mountainside. There's crowds of people there. Some of them who have said, yes, Jesus, we will follow you. Others, they're contemplating. They're still checking Jesus out. There's something about Jesus that's drawn them to this hill to sit there for a good amount of time to take in the word of Jesus Christ. And they're trying to figure out, is this is the Messiah? Is this the Savior? Are we going to follow him? Are we going to forsake everything as he has said we need to do to follow him from this day forward? They're on that hill as Jesus continues to teach them. And he says in Matthew 5, 6, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst or crave for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. To hunger and thirst is to crave. And listen, folks, this is not a mild desire. Craving, a craving is not a mild desire. It's why when I get that craving for chocolate, I'm spending hours looking around the house. And if I don't have it, I'm going to the store uh, to buy me a Hershey's bar. And if I get to the front of the line and realize I, forget my, my, I forgot my wallet, it's the one time I'm contemplating do I just take it? <laughs> just joking. I would never, never. Do. But that's what a craving will do for us. When one craves something, it is an intense desire. To say that you're hungry for something, it means that it's constantly on your mind. You cannot stop thinking about it. You have to have it. To say that you're thirsty for something means that when you need to quench, you need to quench. <laughs> To hunger and thirst speaks of this deep craving, this deep yearning, and it communicates that you're in a passionate pursuit of whatever that crave represents. The scripture speaks of this hunger and thirst for God. The scripture speaks of this, this, this thirsting, this hunger, this craving for God. In the book of Psalm 42, 1 through 2, David says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Again, David says in Psalm 63, 1, he says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David does not speak of being mildly interested in God. When you read those scriptures there in Psalm, there's nothing mild of mild, being mildly interested in God. Rather, he is earnestly seeking the Lord. The scripture says that his soul thirsts 
for the Lord. His flesh faints for the Lord. Do you hear the passion when you read those scriptures in David's soul? Do you hear the desire of those words dripping off of his mouth? You can almost feel David's craving as you read the words, but it's not a craving for the things of this world. It's a craving for God himself. There was something inside of David that caused him to crave his creator. And I know that there is something in you, some of you, there's, there's a group of you here that in that craving, you've been led to the foot of Jesus, the cross, the, the, his crucifixion, uh, the blood that was shed there. He was buried, and three days later, he was raised from the dead, victoriously proven, proving that he was the son of God. There's a group of you that you've come to that place of craving God and you've counted the cost and you've chosen to repent of your sin and to turn to God and to let him have your way, his way inside of you. But there's another group of you that you've been trying to fill, reach for, and grab anything you can to fill that void in your heart. But at the same time, you have also craved God. It's just in your craving for God, you've been pushing him away. You, it's like you don't wanna think about God. There can't be a God. I don't want there to be a God. I'm God. I'm the captain of my own ship. I can fill my void this way. I can fill my void that way. But time and time and time and time again, as you push God away, you have found over and over and over again, the alcohol does not meet that need in your life. The money is, you may have a bank full of money, but it's not doing what you were hoping it would do. Oh, you can go on the vacations, you can buy whatever you want, but every night you go to bed lonely on the inside because that money has never felt that hole in your heart the way you hoped it would. Relationships, we could go on and on with the list of things, but all the while, God has stayed consistently before you you may try to drown him out and push him out, but God has never left you. I was watching, I love wild cats, jaguars, lions, cheetah, all of them. I love, they're, they're amazing creatures. And I was watching a jaguar hunting uh, on TV the other day, and he was moving around, but his eyes was focused on his prey, and he never took his eyes off his prey. He was always right there, just getting closer and closer and closer in a very positive way. That's God with you. He never takes his eyes off of you. He's always in pursuit of you. He's always chasing you. And unlike the jaguar who's just waiting for an opportunity to pounce on his prey, God's just getting closer and closer and closer. And he's waiting for life to do its thing, to bring you to that final place where finally in just that, that, that overwhelming state state of the world, you fall on your knees and you cry out to God and you humble yourself and God is right there to not devour you but to sweep you up into his arms. And it's at that moment in life that many of us in this room have found that craving on the inside of us finally filled when we read the writings of the Apostle Paul, righteousness is tied into our justification. Paul writes about how we're not righteous. <laughs> no, not one, the scripture says. For we were all born sinners, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul writes about how we're not righteous, but God, through Christ Jesus, he makes us righteous. When we come to Christ and we repent and we turn to him and we say, yes, Lord, and we confess him as Lord and Savior of our life and we believe upon him, he at that moment, guess what? He made us who were not righteous. He makes us righteous, not by anything we did, but by faith. He puts on us the righteousness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He clothes us in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, completely cleans us, purifies us, takes that sin and throws it as far as the, the east is from the west. And he throws it, casts it then into the depths of the sea, the sea of forgetfulness, where he will never, ever, ever, Forever, he will never hold our sin against us ever again. Why? Because Jesus won for us justification. See, sin, sin, justice for sin has to be dealt with. 
There will be a day when every single person will stand before the judgment of God. And there will be justice, and it will be done one of two ways. If you have not received Christ as Lord and Savior, there will be judgment pronounced upon you, and you will be cast into utter darkness for all of eternity. That's a whole nother sermon. But if you have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, he will look at you and he will say, justice has already been served. My son paid the price, the penalty. He took care of your sin on your behalf. Jesus won for us what we could never win for ourselves. And see, that's what the world's trying to do. That's what all of us were trying to do. We were trying to win our own salvation. We were trying to get good enough. We were trying to fill that God-shaped hole. If you've been in church for any length of time, you've probably heard that terminology before, that God-shaped hole that only God can fill. And the only thing that can fill that God-shaped hole is the Holy Spirit of God. See, when we come to the cross and he cleans us up with, his blood of, with the blood of Jesus and he gives us righteousness, he puts in that hole, he fills that hole, he sends his Holy Spirit into our life. And the Holy Spirit, once and for all, takes care of that craving that we had for the world. And now we wake up every day just craving him more and craving him more and craving him more. Amen. But he fills us. And it's a, it, it, we, we can go to bed every night and we can be in peace, even when all chaos is going on because we still live in a fallen world and there are wars and rumors of wars. There are things that are beyond our control. There are family breakups and, and all kinds of horrible things that could happen to us, even as Christians in this life. But because we crave him, we can go to bed each and every night and we can be at perfect peace. The Bible says it's a peace that goes beyond our understanding because he's met the need in our heart. Thank you, Jesus. When we read the writings of the God, whoops. Justification is a word that uh, we typically use to describe a repositioning of our soul before God. It's also referred to as reconciliation with God. When we come to Christ, our relationship with God has been restored in full. We've been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, God gives us, we've gone over these a lot, mercy. That's when God withholds from us what we deserve, which is judgment. He decides, I'm going to hold that off until another time in the future. I'm not going to issue my judgment upon them at this time. Then he gives us his grace. That is, he gives us what we, what we don't deserve. That's Jesus Christ. He gives us his son who died in our place on the cross. And then there's justification. That's when God makes us righteous, repositioning ourselves from being a sinner and now being called a saint, a son of God, a child of God, by which we can cry out to him, Abba, Father, amen. Paul states in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is justification. Back to our text in Matthew 5, 6. Jesus on that hill teaching the crowd of people says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be. Now here, Jesus is referring to a spiritual hunger and thirst for righteousness, but not in the positional standpoint. We've already been repositioned. Now, because we've been repositioned and clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, now we hunger and now we thirst for righteousness, rightness, right living. Now there's something in us that wants to live in a right way. We want to be in alignment with the word of God. Does that make sense? Prior to being clothed with the righteousness of Christ, we could care less. We never thought about right living, <laughs> at least often. We did what we want, when we want, how we want. But now, having been clothed with the righteousness of Christ and God's spirit being filling that hole of our heart, now we wake up and we hunger and we thirst and we crave right living. And when we don't live right, we have great conviction in our hearts. And we, by the power of God's spirit in us, we're redirected to get back on track. And the more we resist in that moment, rebelliously, for whatever reasons, the more pressing that conviction gets within our heart until we can't take it anymore. And either God 
takes care of it in trying to bring us back or we come to that place of repentance. Listen, repentance is not a one-time stop. You guys all know that, right? Repentance is every day. And it's, it's a humbling of ourselves, a recognition that God is greater in me than he who is in the world. And I can't do this daily walk with him apart from his help. This hunger and thirst, it's impulsive. It's stirred up by God's Holy Spirit at work within us. The Greek word for righteousness is dikaios, and it means the rightness of character before God and right actions before men. So the usage of righteousness here is not about our position, but it is about our actions. The righteousness of God can be communicated as all that God is, all that he commands, all that God demands, all that God approves, and all that God provides through Jesus Christ. As a follower of Jesus Christ, righteousness will be seen as this, as evidence of our salvation. It will be an evidence of our salvation. Righteousness will be a mark of being a disciple. It's why Jesus is giving them the disciple code or the Beatitudes. He's teaching them how they are to now live. Before Christ, they could not live that way, but now in Christ, he's teaching them, training them, discipling them, mentoring them, them, because now with God's word and his Holy Spirit, they are empowered and capable of living in a right way, amen. I wanna give you four quick truths as the worship team gets ready. I wanna give you four truths about your righteousness as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Number one is this. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, righteousness will be your priority. It will be your priority. Every day you will want to live in a right way. Matthew 6, says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You understand that as you focus first on rightness, God's rightness, that God will take care of everything else. He will be your provision. You don't need to spend or waste all of your time. Not that we don't have to work, but you don't have to spend all of your time worrying about how God will lead you, God will direct you, God will bless you, God will promote you, God will take care of things as you seek his rightness first. To seek God's kingdom and his righteousness means to live in an ongoing repentance from sin. It's a sincere, from the heart, devoted to God type of a lifestyle by which we wake up every morning excited to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole Sermon on the Mount is Jesus addressing this priority of righteousness in those who wanted to follow him or those who had said yes to following after him. Number two, righteousness will be practiced. In Matthew 6, the practice of righteousness referred to prayer and generosity, fasting. So every time we pray, every time we share with someone else, every time we tithe, help someone else, give to the poor, serve those who are coming tonight to shine. Every time we do these acts of rightness, we're practicing righteousness before the Father. Now, Jesus did give us one warning when it came to practicing our righteousness, and that was this. In Matthew 6, 1, he said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So there was a warning from Jesus, an encouragement and a warning. Practice rightness. Practice righteousness. But because you want to honor God, but because it's the right thing to do, but because God's spirit is leading you to do so, don't practice righteousness just so everyone can see you. In other words, hey, it's great when you come to the altars to pray when you're seeking God, but don't just come to the altar to pray so everyone can see you come to the altar to pray because then you just lost your reward in heaven and God knows the intent of our hearts. When we come to serve at night to shine, we don't just come to serve because we want to say, hey, we were on the team. <laughs> we, were on, we, we had a win, yay, and it is. It's going to be a win. It's going to be a lot of fun. But we come out of a love for God for people who need to experience his love and be reminded that just because they may have a disability, we see the love of God for them, and we want them to experience the joy and know that they're not forgotten about. They're not less than. They are a child of God, and we want them to know it. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Number three, 
righteousness must be personal. One way that you might determine your own personal righteousness, in other words, give yourself an evaluation. Where, where are you in your relationship with the Lord when it comes to righteousness is this. How do I live out the gospel when no one else but God is watching? How do I live that out? All of us can think of times in our life where we failed miserably in some of those moments. But that's okay because God is wanting you to rise above that moment. He's empowered you to begin walking steps of victory. There could be a number of reasons that you could diagnose as to why in that moment you failed, but God wants to empower you to have victory in those moments. I want you to know that if you are a child of God, and you look at your life and you see many times where in your relationship with the Lord, you seemingly have not done the right things, that today you can turn it around with the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to let God's word speak truth. You have to understand that, hey, this is more than a religion. Coming to church can be a religion. It can be a practice that we do just on Sundays. But church should be a practice that's every day. Tina and I have a saying that we like to say, the everyday church. When we have the Rice Prayer Challenge, we like to think of ourselves as the everyday church. Doing church every day. Sharing scripture every day. Praying together every day. Reminding each other every day that we're on mission for the Lord today. Amen. Hallelujah. So some of us over times or at times maybe haven't been very good about doing right things always when no one else is watching but God. But God wants to help you turn that around. And it begins with that craving on the inside and understanding that there's nothing this world can give you or offer you that's going to take care of that longing on the inside of you. Only God can fill that hole, that longing, those desires on the inside of you. Alcohol is not going to take care of it. Pornography is not going to take care of it. Other relationships aren't going to take care of it. Money's not going to take care of it. Only God. And he's wanting to help you, if you're his child, to begin every day to have wins in that area of your life. Amen? The Bible tells us that we ought to have a personal evaluation to see, to test if we're really in the faith. It's something that's important for us to do, to ask ourselves that question. For some of us, we may ask ourselves that question and realize that we never really made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. We did ask him into our heart, but we never made the commitment to repent, turn from the way we're living, and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So upon that evaluation, you might determine that I need to give my life, surrender my life to the Lord. I've just been religious, but I need to give him my heart. I need to give him my mind. Amen? And for others of you, these moments uh, will build you up because you will see how when you were alone, you spent time in prayer. You spent time thinking about the things of the Lord. You spent time serving, helping someone. You were out on the street witnessing, sharing your faith. You were involved in a soup kitchen, feeding the hungry, and no one else knew. People at the kitchen obviously knew, but you didn't tell anyone in your family. No one at work knew what you were doing. You're simply out there loving on people, or maybe you're helping to take care of your neighbor. There's one, love thy neighbor as thyself. Maybe you spend time taking care of your neighbor. Maybe they're old, disabled, uh, having a difficult time, and you sacrifice and you give of yourself to help your neighbor. When no one else is watching, God sees what you're doing with your time and how you're utilizing your gifts, your talents, and your skills for his glory. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied forth and last, if you crave righteousness, here's the, here's the good piece. Here's the final piece. You will be satisfied. Satisfaction will come. What does satisfaction mean? There's an emotional component to this word satisfied. Most people are never satisfied. <laughs> Most people are not because they're pursuing contentment in other things. And they can't get satisfaction that way. But Jesus promised when we spend time with him and craving the things that he has to give us, then we shall be 
satisfied, or as the King James says, we shall be filled up and to overflowing. One can picture a person who has just enjoyed a really great meal, <laughs> and he's full, and he leans back in his chair after having just really enjoyed it, taking the nap, goes, wow, that was good, that was so good, I'm so full, I can't eat another bite. So what's for dessert? <laughs> It's that moment of craving righteousness. We can never get enough of the Lord and he never stops filling us. See, the word, the world doesn't fill us, but God fills us and he keeps filling us and he keeps filling us. The more we crave him, the more he fills us up and the more we're satisfied in his presence. The worship team's gonna come, they're gonna sing a song and I'm just gonna ask you, let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart as they sing this song this morning. Maybe you might want to close your eyes and bow your head.
I'm not going to mix words at this moment <laughs> because I know God's been dealing with some of your hearts. Some of you may be in this church for the first time, but it's not the first time you've felt the presence of God knocking on your heart's door, giving you an invitation to come and follow him, not receive him into your heart, but to leave your old life of sin, to repent and to come and to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and that by his grace, grace through your faith, you're ready to leave it all behind and to follow after Jesus Christ, trusting that he will forgive your sins and he will empower you and fill you with everything we've talked about and even so much more as you read his word. We have a prayer team up here today, and if that's you, you say, Pastor Tim, I need Jesus in my life. I need forgiveness of my sin. I need this whole taken care of, and I'm ready to leave behind this old world that I've been trying and trying to fill myself with, and I'm at the place where I'm ready to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's you today, you've never done that, made that commitment to the Lord, I want you to get out of that seat and just come and join me right here up front. I know it takes guts, but Jesus said to count the cost. He said, if you're not willing to break ties with father and mother, brother and sister, and yes, even your own life, you cannot follow me. So if you're at that place where you understand your sin and you need a savior and you're ready to lay it all down to give Christ that prominent place in your heart, then I'm gonna ask you to come as our altar workers come forward. I'm gonna ask you to come and to meet me right now. Take that step and let the God who created you fill that hole that you've been trying to take care of yourself. Once and for all, I believe you will leave this place with that peace that surpasses all understanding and a whole new outlook will begin to be birthed within you and you will wake up tomorrow in a different way than you woke up today. Praise God. Let's all stand to our feet and if that's you, would you come and join me at the front right now without any hesitation? Praise God. We're gonna give just a second for you to do that this morning. If that's you, come and join me. You're ready to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You're ready to lay it all down you're ready to let God finally have that opportunity to do what it is he's wanting to do in your life. You know you need forgiveness. The weight of sin at times is so overbearing. And nothing that you've tried to take care of this sin is working. You are left to know for sure that what you need is a relationship with Jesus Christ. If that's you, would you be bold enough to come to this altar today? Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. If you're a believer here this morning, let's just take the next 30 seconds. Would you join me in prayer that if there be anyone in this place that feels the pressing of God upon their heart, that they would not allow fear to keep them in their seat. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today. And Lord God, I pray that your spirit, Lord God, would continue to chase until that moment, Lord God, where we're ready, Lord God, to receive your embrace, Father God. For someone in this room, Lord, if they're here, may now be that moment of finally laying it down and receiving all that you have to give. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're gonna move on this morning. Our worship team is gonna begin to sing another song. And as they do, these altars are open. For some of you in this room, God really ministered to your heart in a very specific way today. And you know you need a little personal time with the Lord. Oh, you can do it at your seat, and that's fine. <laughs> you can do it right there. But there are some that you just need to acknowledge what God's doing, and you need to come down, and you need to humble yourself at the altar of the Lord. Listen, and for some, it may not be a humbling. For some, it's an understanding of God's righteousness and your desire of just wanting more of that. And you symbolically are coming to this altar today to press in and to seek all of him that he's willing to give. So as the worship team sings that song this morning, let's close this time together in a personal moment with God. And for some of you, join me at the altar as we press in together.